Father, we, we, uh, we come to you as we open your word and just, uh, as always, just pray for the Spirit to provide instruction for us. We pray, Lord, that you will um, illuminate these words for our understanding so that we'll have a, a better picture of what it is that you want us to know and what you want us to be and what you want us to do. Uh, I pray, Father, that as we try to unlock the mysteries of, of your end times, we pray, Father, that you'll just give us a keen insight as a result of having studied this passage. And so we, we pray that you'll be glorified, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's actually become quite fashionable today for young thinkers to espouse the theory that the Holocaust never happened. In fact, it's a, a big part of our decline, in the church's decline in significant influence in the culture is due to this generation's overwhelming dependence on Hollywood and television and their dependence upon digital video entertainment. And what clouds their vision is their knowledge that or, or their conception that what they see was staged somewhere by some film producers, so they really don't trust a lot. And even more recently than the Holocaust, people today deny the landing and walking on the moon, despite mountains of evidence, which could be said about several things going on these days. There are mountains of evidence around many different things that people don't know about. But let's return to the Holocaust for a second. Despite the museum which we've seen, we've seen in Washington, D.C., and the one in Jerusalem, which I have. I don't know if you went there or not, but Gail's been there. So it, it contains tens of thousands of pieces of evidence about the Holocaust, but yet people still refuse to believe that it actually happened. The truth is, when you look throughout human history, almost nothing is more believable than the senseless and racist persecution of Jewish people. Anti-Semitism is much more real today than these invented theories of white supremacy and systemic racism that engulf us today. It would take an entire sermon just to outline the history of assaults on Jewish people throughout the ages, some of which are recorded in, his, in, in Scripture. And yet as we study scripture again, we see it in Revelation, God has judged his people for their disobedience, but always with a view toward bringing them to repentance. But on the other hand, the great persecution of Israel in the end times will feature the inventor of anti-Semitism, which is Satan himself. The purpose of God in anything is always corrective. The purpose of God in chastening Israel is always with a view to bringing them to repentance and salvation. I mean, it's one form of top love. It's the judgment of love. On the other hand, Israel has suffered severely at the hands of Satan whose purpose is purely destructive to bring them to death and hell rather than to repentance and salvation. So you see the completely opposite ends of the spectrum here. Here we'll see the judgment of love against the judgment of hate and anger. Thus the Jews have been hit from the two most formidable powers in the universe, that of God Almighty and of Satan himself. Throughout the centuries, the Jews have suffered in these two ways, and yet as bad as it has been, worst is yet to come. Jeremiah 37 speaks of a time in the future that is referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. Jesus in Matthew 24 said it will be a time of trouble, a time of tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall. It will be the worst of times. Because God's final fury will be poured out of the world and on unrepentant and unbelieving Jews 
who will be destroyed in hell, and Satan's final fury will be poured out on those who believe in, in Jesus Christ, and in particularly on the nation of Israel, who will yet again be slaughtered under his power. So the great persecution is yet to come. The great judgment of God is yet to come. And yet while the Jews would certainly be hoping that the worst is over, it isn't. Let's look at verses 13 and 14. We'll see a satanic following. A satanic following. 13 says, And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place where she was nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So there are, there are three conflicts that are described in this particular passage that will show Satan's armies doing battle against Israel during the tribulation. This is the first of three battles. In the early part of the chapter, we saw the battle in heaven symbolized by a woman who represents Israel, and she gave birth to a son who would obviously be Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah. And we also need to remember that the warrior angel Michael helped throw Satan from heaven down to earth, and now we'll see the vast fury of Satan unleashed because, as we saw last week, he knows he only has a short time left. Thus, he begins a persecution of the woman. The word persecuted is actually a bit strong here, which is unusual for us. The Greek verb here literally translates to pursue or to hunt. But it's safe to say that there is evil intent behind this stalking because it's used two other times in the New Testament, in Matthew 23, 34, and in Acts 26, 11. And in both of those instances, the pursuit clearly comes with hostile intent. And we haven't come to this point yet, but there will come a time during the reign of the Antichrist where life in Israel becomes bleak. Jewish people will be desperate for help, and God will mercifully provide people who will help them, as we can see in Matthew 25, the words of our Lord. Help will come in the unpredictable form of Gentiles, who will demonstrate their new nature resulting from their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, these Messianic Jews, as we refer to them today, risk their resources and, their, and even their lives by coming to the aid of these terrorized and persecuted Jews. As we'll see here, not only will God use new converts to help, but we will see direct divine involvement in helping his people. There are a couple of familiar themes represented in this first section. First, there's the fantastic imagery of two wings of a great eagle. It connects us with Exodus 19.4. It says, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And the second, as we saw last week, the obvious connection between these verses and the book of Daniel, we should notice that there is also a connection between Exodus and Revelation. There is also a connection between Daniel and Revelation in the both prophecy, both prophesy a similar theological point that states that Satan will attempt to reverse the faith of the saints, but he will not succeed. Now, last week we saw the war in heaven as an expansion of verse 4, and here we see the war on earth picking up from verse 6. Satan was clearly defeated in heaven and was eternally denied access to God where he has accused and slandered God's people since the garden. And as if God doesn't know these things. I mean, God doesn't need Satan to tell him how lousy I am. The male child has successfully completed his ministry and his mission and is back in his rightful place next to the presence of God the Father. And remember, as we saw last week, Satan is mad. Because he only has a short time left, and his target is Israel, represented here in the form of a woman who has fled into the wilderness. And perhaps by this point, she not only represents Israel, but also people who believe in Jesus Christ. 
see verse 14 here as repeating verse 6. We can clearly see divine protection and providence as she is delivered from the enemy. Eagles were the largest birds known in Israel, and these great wings majestically deliver her to safety. But we shouldn't think of this like we the, the image that we get probably naturally when we see this is that of the American bald eagle. That's kind of what we think of when we see this. These are huge birds. These are more like what we would call buzzards or vultures. And in the same word, this particular same word here is translated in the New Testament, both eagles and vultures. So don't think of this, this bird, the, the American symbol. Think of this gigantic thing. We might add here that we're not given a specific location of the wilderness. All we know is that she, is she goes into the wilderness. But Jesus warned in Matthew 25 to flee to the mountains. So it's likely not in the area that's near the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea, which you, you'll know from looking at the, the map of Israel, is uh, there, there's kind of a coastal plain there. Uh, so it's probably not there, and it's probably not the desert region. But there is a mountainous region that is east of Jerusalem, and that gets support, biblical support. Daniel 11.41 says, He will also enter the beautiful land, and many countries will fall, but these will be rescued out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the foremost of the sons of Ammon. And we know from the Old Testament that the ancient lands of Moab and Edom and Ammon were east of Israel. And they could provide a safe haven for his people. In Isaiah, the wings symbolize strength. And in 2 Samuel, they demonstrate speed. However, in the Psalms and in Deuteronomy, they point toward protection. Here we see all three notions. Whatever type of bird this is, it serves as an appropriate representation of God's exodus, if you will, or protective deliverance of his people. And now we'll see in the next chapter that Israel and other Christian converts will be cut off by the world system. So God will miraculously provide for his people. Just as he provided manna and quail as they wandered through the wilderness in the Old Testament, he will provide for his people during the tribulation. Here we see the phrase again, a time, times, and half a time, which first appeared in Daniel 7.25 and refers to the second half of the tribulation, which, as you know by now, the Lord referred to as the great tribulation. That's the time frame in which the Jewish and the Gentile converts to Christianity will seek refuge from the very angry Satan and his demons. And as we'll see, this will also be a period of time in which the Antichrist will govern, so to speak. But God will protect Israel and his church. Satan can probably figure out where everyone is hiding, but due to God's protection, he will be unable, Satan will be unable to reach them. And from that, we'll see the second battle. Let's look in verses 15 and 16, and we'll see a satanic flooding. Satan satanic flooding. Verse 15 says, And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman, so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. The earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of his mouth. Now, here's the second battle between Satan and the Israelites of the future. And even though his first battle failed, he's not quite finished. He reloads with some long-range tactics here to destroy these people. And we should see this serpent not as a literal snake as we know it, but one, remember, he was fighting in heaven with Michael the archangel. And he is a representation of Satan himself. Now the word here spews or poured is literally the word that is often used and translated throws. The Greek word is balo, means to throw. The translators chose a more vivid word here to to describe all this, and they probably did pretty well. They don't 
do any harm to the author's intent. And we don't know exactly what this is. Large, I mean, is it a dam breaking? I mean, I get the image of a fire hydrant blowing out full steam, but a fire hydrant is not going to cause a flood. But it's going to be something, something like a dam breaking or something like that that's going to cause a flood. I mean, it's going to, it's going to provide problems here. As we just discussed with wings, when we see floods in the Old Testament, we need to understand the obvious message of trouble in general, as well as what normally follows in a flood is an invading, destructive army. And aside from references to the flood of Noah, Job, Jeremiah, and Daniel all use the word figuratively. The image portrayed in John's vision is that Satan's invading, destructive army will sweep toward the area where the Jews are hiding in an irrepressible fashion, much like a flood. I've never been in one, but I have to imagine there's nothing that, that is more of a helpless feeling than just being swept away like that. However, as, as we've just read, the earth comes to the rescue for Israel and swallows the floodwaters. Now, there are a, few, are a few possibilities for what this is telling us. In a song of celebration in Exodus 15, when God parted the Red Sea and drowned Pharaoh's army, we read in verse 12 of Exodus 15, you stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thus, it could be that God causes an earthquake to swallow Satan's troops and to save the hiding fleeing Jews. We, we, we also see a flood in Nahum, but it is used as a picture of overwhelming evil. And it could be a flood of lies and deceit in an attempt to drown Israel in sin. As we'll see in a few weeks, it could also refer to the river of lies that threaten Christians in these last days. When you look back at it, you can see a stark contrast between these days and the river of life that flows from the throne of God, as we'll see in the final chapter. We cannot be dogmatic about this, but we can understand the connection. But just like the Red Sea, God will use the earth to miraculously protect his people. Let's look in verse 17. We'll see satanic fighting. Satanic fighting. Verse 17. So the dragon was enraged with the woman. And went off to make war with the rest of her children, who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So here we read about a third attack. As a frustrated dragon who obviously still represents Satan. He will turn his anger in a different direction. And there are a few possibilities here as well. The question is, who are these people? The answer could be Gentiles who convert to Christianity during the tribulation. Other scholars refer to them, identify them as the 144,000 that are mentioned back in chapter 7, and we'll see again in chapter 14. Could be. That's not bad. They could be included in this. But I think it seems best to understand this, as we've already mentioned, of a broadly general phrase that refers to everyone who has taken the name of Jesus. At this point, as you can imagine, there will be converts from all kinds of different places. They'll realize that everything they've heard about Jesus is true. And with their lives on the line, they'll trust in him. But probably the best support that we have for this is found right here in the text. They're described as people who obey the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. I mean, what a great description to have. Wouldn't you want that said of you? Somehow if you could jam all that on a tombstone, that'd be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it? This is someone who professes Christ and someone who has a biblical worldview. Somebody who obeys the teachings of Christ. So now don't think of it as commandments. When you see the word commandments here, don't just let your mind jump immediately to what you and I refer to as the Ten Commandments that's located in Exodus chapter 20 is delivered on Mount Sinai. 
John uses this word frequently in his gospel and in his letters to refer to New Testament commands. We must remember that this is written around 90 AD, and by then the copies of the Gospels and Acts and all of Paul's and Peter's letters have been fully circulated and have become a, a, a working part of the culture of the church. This is where we find John's frequent use of the word that we translate commandment to refer to the teachings primarily of Jesus and Paul. The commandments of God refer to just that. Biblical law, biblical teaching. This, this Greek word is entole. It appears 25 times in the writings of John. And all but one refer, so that 24 out of 25 refers to New Testament commands. It refers to the commands of the gospel, the marks of a true believer. The testimony of Jesus means that the testimony that Jesus gave, the word of Christ, the revealed truth of Scripture. Anyone who obeys God and adheres to Scripture, he goes after them. So when we see the testimony of Jesus, he's not referring to testimony about Jesus. He's referring to the teachings of the Lord as recorded in the Gospels. These believers attempting to avoid persecution from the evil one will give further accounts that their faith is genuine by the fact that they obey what the Bible says. Many people claim to be Christian simply because their families are Christian rather than being Jewish or Muslim. But there's no evidence of true conversion because their lives do not exhibit the fruit of the indwelling Holy Spirit, which comes from a complete surrender to Jesus as Lord, as well as Savior, and then living in a way that follows the biblical teachings. So this third attack has been launched, and just like the other two, has been squelched. Satan has reached into his arsenal and he's fired three of his best weapons at these refugee saints only to have God thwart all three of them. And we already saw that in the seventh trumpet in chapter 11, Christ will reign forever and ever and the saints are going to be triumphant. God is going to protect them and take them into the kingdom. Now we know there will be many Gentiles in the kingdom because Christ rules the nations with a rod of iron, as we've seen a few weeks ago. So the Gentiles have to be there. And in the thousand year period, will repopulate the world. And we fool ourselves into thinking that obedience is a word that is reserved for children and pets. The truth is that it permeates everything that we do in life. We have family members to whom we submit. We have leaders in the church and state to whom we submit. We submit to one another within the church and the home. And even if you own your own business and are head of your home, you're involved in leadership everywhere. If you call Jesus Lord, then you obey Him. It's that simple. These people will literally be running for their lives and they depend on God for His protection. But their lives are characterized by the fact that they are obedient to Him. Now, this particular aspect emphasizes quite well the notion that obedience is a central element of endurance. Scripture teaches us in a number of locations that perseverance is a great evidence that our faith is genuine and permanent. Saints persevere. If there is no perseverance, there is no salvation. In the event that your Bible has a verse 18, understand that there are variances among early manuscripts that have been found. When chapter and verse numbers were installed in about the 6th century, some of them were a bit different. The only thing that's important to us is that all the words are there, because the words are what was inspired. The chapter numbers and verses were done by humans. The numbering system was not inspired. And we'll talk about this more next week as, we, as we'll see that the things get jumbled a little bit. In Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul uses the image of armor to relay the concept that Christians are engaged in a spiritual battle. John's writings, however, tell us that the ultimate battle has already been decided. 
Satan and his demons have been defeated and what awaits them is the harshest punishment for all creatures to have to endure. Eternity in the lake of fire. In the meantime, however, he battles every day all he's got left because he can read. I don't know if y'all know that. He's, he can read the, the last of the book and he knows that he loses. So what's he got left? He's going to take as many people to hell with him as possible. So what we need to understand is that God never sends people to hell. We're born with a sin nature that condemns us to hell, but God provides a life preserver so that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord and clearly keeps his commandments and holds to the testimony of Jesus will be spared from hell. The only reason God sends people to hell is because they have neglected or rejected the truth of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Those who belong to Christ have entered the spiritual battlefield on God's side and they have been guaranteed victory for eternity even if their lives on earth don't turn out as expected. Even if your life is, is by a lot of contemporary standards disastrous, just think of how wonderful eternity in heaven is going to be. So guess what? Even when you lose, you win. From reading and studying Revelation, we can take great assurance of the fact that God wins the war. But there remains an intense battle for the souls around us. And this is not a battle that we can lose. We're losing the cultural war in America. I don't <coughs> think many of you are going to disagree with me on this. But our focus needs to be on the souls of those all around us who need the absolute assurance of their faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. Believers cannot allow our commitment to Christ to be shaken. Unbelievers still have time to repent of their sins and to follow Him, but we're clearly running out of time. Indecision is the same as rejection. There is no repentance from the grave. It's an absolutely incredible picture. From Israel's standpoint, the worst is yet to come. And yet, from Israel's standpoint, the best is yet to come. Their final judgment by God is the, in, in the purging and refining will come, as will their final great holocaust at the hands and the power of Satan, as well as their salvation and the promised kingdom. In the end, Satan will be bound for the thousand years and then at the end of the thousand years will be cast into the lake of fire. And when I look at the things involving the end times, one thing jumps out at me that is more fascinating than the scenes of war between good and evil, both in heaven and on earth. And that's the idea that God has opened my eyes and allowed me to see the error of my ways. Words fail us when trying to describe God, but the best that we can offer falls short of how marvelous it is. Our beloved creator of the universe threw me a life preserver and asked me if I needed help, which I obviously did. I have been redeemed from the horrible punishment that will come to those who neglect him or reject him simply because he loved me and made the provision for me and anyone who accepts his plan of salvation. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we just thank you for the fact that as we think of all of your wonderful attributes, all the different things that you have done for us, we marvel at the fact that you saved us. That as we were heading for the punishment that we so richly deserve, that you sent your son Jesus. And you asked only that we believe in him and follow his teachings. 
I pray, Father, if there's anyone in this room or anyone watching over the internet who needs the assurance of their salvation in Jesus Christ, I pray, Father, that through the power of your Spirit that you will allow that to happen even now. We commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So Mark and Taylor are here. They're going to lead us in a couple of verses of a hymn of invitation. And the Lord is speaking to you this morning. If there's anything that you'd like to share about, I'll be down front. If there's any kind of business you need to do with the Lord, we can talk about it. So if you're sharing with us, uh, time with us over the internet, you communicate with us. We just pray that you'll be open to what God has for you, even now. While they play and as they sing, you come. Thanks.